Clico and CL Financial for a third week, but this one takes a bit of a twist. On Friday, the Ministry of Finance released a statement, in effect putting the financial business of the chairman of the Clico Policyholders Group, Mr. Peter Permel, in the road, as we see. But it raises several questions. Mr. David Walker has been involved in the fight for a number of years. The Minister of Finance gave a long response on Thursday, but before we get to that, your immediate reaction to the release of Mr. Purmel's financial information to the public. Good morning, how are you? Good morning, I'm very good this morning, thank you. I would like to get your reaction on, on the disclosure of, of this information. Well, I've heard Mr. Purmel's response and I couldn't agree more. Um, it is totally out of order for the minister to be disclosing what is, after all, private financial information in the way that he did. There is, in my mind, no justification for it, but I'd be willing to hear what the minister has to say about his justification. But I'll go a little further than what Mr. Pomel has said. We aspire, so we told by every successive administration, to be an international financial center. It does, us, it does our reputation no good in our aspiration to be an international financial center, to have a person in the position of the Minister of Finance openly disclosing what ought to be private financial information of somebody dealing within the financial services sector. I remember not long ago where a member of the current administration had her financial information disclosed by a bank, and they were up in arms about it. How does he now justify doing the same thing to Mr. Pomel? Now, if on the other hand he turns wrong and says that he did it in the public interest because Mr. Pomel is in a public space um, speaking about it and that is important for people to know, then carry that through to his logical conclusion and disclose all the information of people whose disclosure would be in the public interest, as Mr. Afra Raymond has asked for. But I'm going to be even more specific than Af Mr. Afra Raymond. Disclose the details of all the people who worked for the central bank who had policies. Disclose the details of all the people who worked for the Ministry of Finance who had policies. Disclose the names of all the people at the auditors, Price Waterhouse Coopers, who had policies. And what happened to those policies? Were they paid um, prior to the, to the bailout in the immediate precedence of the, of the bailout, immediately after? or were they left to suffer like all the other policyholders? If we're talking about doing this in the public interest, then all of that has to be disclosed. But let me go a little further than that. When the CLECO resolution plan was announced, and it started to be put in place in 2011, I wrote a piece where I asked the question as to whether this means of paying people will result in individuals' financial data ending up in the hands of politicians. I asked a specific question. I got a response via email from the then managing director of CLECO, Ms. Carolyn John, who assured me that that was not the case and they had put structures in place to ensure that politicians did not get access to people's private financial information. So my question now really, and this is where I say I go a little further than Mr. Pumel, is how did he get the information? Was it through the force of his office, if you like, or did he go as a normal citizen like you or I and ask for the information and somehow receive it? We need to know how Mr. Imbert got hold of the information about Mr. Pomel's policy. And further than that, once we know, as we do now, that it is possible for him to receive that information, what other information have they been retrieving? Have they, as a matter of course, been seeking information about policyholders and the, their financial situation vis-a-vis -vis CLECO. Now, Mr. Mr. Embert, on Thursday, he did mention that a request was made, I guess, by a, a via Mr. Afro Raymond, uh, via the Freedom and Information Act, to provide the names of all persons who sold their policy to government uh, between 2012, 2011, and 2012. However, he said that in the interest of uh, the issue of invasion of privacy came up, and he refused to, to reveal that information. So, so here it is we're hearing that... Uh, there is an issue with respect to revealing names and information with respect to the invasion of privacy. I think names address the amount of money in the colonial life, yes. um, et cetera. 
But here it is we have information being revealed by Mr. Peter per, well, on Mr. Peter Permel. Well, now he is saying, Mr. Permel is saying that he felt as though he was being targeted after he raised concerns about the controversial deal transfer of no man's land from Clico to the government. He even went on to say that personally as a citizen, he thought as though it was an attempt to have him be muzzled um, for speaking out and raising legitimate concerns. Do you think Mr. Imbert crossed the line here? Absolutely. I am in total agreement with Peter Pumel on this issue. There could be no other reason for that information being disclosed other than trying to get at Mr. Pumel. To muzzle Pumel. him? You think it, it was a, a strategy to... Why to else muzzle? does he want to get at Mr. Pumel? I, I don't assume that there's any personal um, relationship between them. The only relationship that I am aware of is with respect to the click on CL financial thing about which Ms. Mr. Pumel has been very vocal. I do not necessarily agree with everything that Mr. Pumel says, but that does not give anybody the justification to get hold of his private financial data and disclose it to the public. It is simply wrong and it is probably also illegal. All right, so let's, let's look at some of the other issues that were brought up. At the last day you were here, we spoke about illegal fees that we, we, we thought the, the figure was uh, somewhere around $3 billion, but here it is the Minister of Finance is, say, is saying it's $250 million. A lot of other figures, um, even the Project Rebirth, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that because there were some statements that the Minister of Finance made about Project Rebirth which, which you know, put some questions on the table about the legitimacy and reliability of Project Rebirth. Well, let me start with Project Rebirth. The mere fact that we're discussing Project Rebirth is a significant factor in, in describing the failure of the government's position. We shouldn't be discussing a, a proposal from the, from the shareholders. We should be discussing a proposal from the government. The government has not put a proposal on the table or a plan on the table to say this is how we get out of this situation. This is how we eventually return the company to the private sector and hopefully health but more importantly, return all those funds to the taxpayer. There is nothing on the table from the government. And the fact that it has taken the shareholders to put something on the table, for me, is a damning indictment of the government. All right, so let's talk figures, evaluations that were put forward by Project Rebirth. Um, I mean, there was a stark difference between the evaluations put forward by uh, the Minister of Finance um, from the audit. Okay, there are, two, there are two sets of issues there. One is the, the overall issue of valuations in the plan, and there's a specific issue of the no man's land. Right. Now, on the no man's land, I take a very simple position, and that is that we've recently implemented procurement legislation, and we've been told about all the virtues of the procurement legislation, one of which is, for me, that if we follow the procurement legislation, proper procurement procedures, the correct price will fall out at the end. So I don't want to invest my time determining whether it should be 100,000 or 200,000 or 200 million. The procurement process will do that if it is correctly implemented. And the government on this issue and several other issues, the whole Sandals thing seems determined to bypass proper procurement procedures despite their claim that they support it and that it is in the best interest of the nation and it avoids corruption, et cetera, et cetera, and they just drive a coach and horses through it. So, so do you think the next step to the government, apart from you know, liquidation, that they should produce a, a proposal? The government must produce a proposal. At some point in time, the law will catch up with them. They will have to return the company to its owners. Now, once we get to that position, the government has to put something on paper to say, you have to pay us $5 because, and there has to be a document that justifies the $5. So at some point, they will have to do it. I can't understand why they are waiting till they are forced to do it, rather than doing it up front, where they have a much stronger negotiating position. You have, a, as a government, you have a much stronger position when the shareholders are still fighting and wanting to get their company back, they'll be more likely to compromise. Then if it goes to court and the, policy and the shareholders win, then what is your bargaining power? So, so put your proposal, put your plan on the table now and see whether you could get the best possible agreement with the shareholders. Now, remember the project rebirth, I mean, it's something that the shareholders would have really spoken about at some great length. Yes. Right. But however, the minister said that essentially the proposal had no security 
no collateral. It was totally unacceptable. And it would essentially mean that they would have regained control of the companies without even making the payment. Well, they can't make a payment until they get control of the company. And they can't, in my view, they shouldn't have done Project Reboot. This is my personal okay, view. Okay. For, the same, for the very same reason we've, we've articulated so often, and that is they do not have access to the information that they really need to have. And that doesn't fall as a problem to them. That's the government's fault. That's Imbert and his team's fault. You can't expect people to put forward a proposal that will stand you know, top class scrutiny if they do not have access to the underlying data. So, so the, the onus is on the government in this regard. Right. So remember, we were talking about why didn't these administrations put forward the audited account. So the, yes. the Minister of Finance spoke on that. He said, simply because there were no audited accounts and the government has been in power. This present administration has been in power for less than two years. So it wasn't really a sufficient time to get it done. However, they are in the process of working on it. So it should be made available soon. How do you respond to that? Well, there are a number of issues there again. One is he made an announcement recently that there is a set of audited statements available. And, but when we look on the website, there's nothing. Well, he, he didn't say it's available yet, but it will be available soon because their auditors are currently working on it, the yeah. directors on, on the board. Yeah, but I find it inconceivable. I don't care which party was in power. It is inconceivable in my mind that if you're saying you're managing this thing responsibly, that you could be making decisions about expenditure of $20 billion of taxpayers' funds and only now discover that you don't have audited statements. Weren't they asking for audited statements? Did this, did this regime not ask for audited statements the minute they walked through the door? Because more than a year has gone by since then. That was more than sufficient time for some of the reports that have been coming in. So I, I take that with a pinch of salt. I also recall a statement by Hawaii, Minister Hawaii, a few years ago, and I have a copy of it on the so computer. The former finance minister. That, former finance minister, where he said that he had gotten Ernst and Young in to validate the figures that he was speaking about. What's happened to that report? If they, they employed a reputable firm to validate the figures and to be very sure about what they were saying, which at the time included payment of all policyholders, including the assenting policyholders in full. If that was done, where is the report and, and why are they now saying something different? Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Walker. It's always a pleasure having you on and we hope to continue these discussions as information continue to, to uh, be made available to us. All right, so